and welcome to everybody and thank you all for coming and joining us this evening. I'm just overwhelmed and delighted to see you. It's just wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I do want before starting my talk, as it were, to thank a few people. Um, apart from the Shoreham Society for inviting me, I would like to thank my darling daughter for all of her support and help, not only over the years, but with all of this technical stuff that I can't cope with. But neither can I. <laughs> well, you're learning and I'm not. Um, one of the people I do feel um, should be thanked is Nina Emmett, who edited this book. And I just want everybody to know that Nina is a marvelous editor and should be known and appreciated. And thank you very much, Nina, for all of your hard work. Thank you also, my darling daughter, for your ongoing support and help. Now, what are we going to talk about? Well, we have a wonderful book that has just been published about your life as a photographer and with full right. of amazing photographs. And I'm going to share the screen. This is the cover of the book. And it's a photograph from Lebanon. And it's a really big book. It's, a, it's, a, it's not only really a big, big book, it's a heavy book. And it's fantastic. So you mustn't drop it on your toes because you will break every one of them. It's that heavy. So uh, one of the first photographs in the book is the first portrait that Marilyn ever took. Yes, it was indeed my very first portrait. Um, as uh, you mentioned earlier, I had gone to New York with the idea of not becoming Shirley Temple because by that time I was too old, but I was going to become the great American actress. That was my destiny as a child. And um, I never actually did. I had a few uh, roles on Broadway and off Broadway and summer stock and all that sort of thing. And even in early television, um, I have a claim to fame that um, I actually acted in, in a early TV film with Hedy Lamar's husband, which I thought was rather interesting. At any rate, I met a lot of people in New York. Among them were a group of documentary filmmakers, and they wanted to make a film on Albert Einstein. It was following the war. The atom bomb had been dropped, and it was just before the 1948 elections in the United States, and there was a lot of talk about atomic bombs, and the people who made the film wanted Einstein to speak out against atomic war and atomic use, uh, the use of atomic energy for warfare, which he did in the film. But it was an interesting experience for me because although I had been using a rather old and broken down gifted Roliflex to take photographs as a learning process. Um, I had never worked with a 35 millimeter film and a 35 millimeter camera. And I was in the back seat of the car on the way to Princeton, given a 35 mil camera and told that I was going to take stills on this shoot. And a little bit gobsmacked, I learned how to use that camera in the back seat of the car. And shot only a few photographs of Einstein. The film was given to the director. I was given a few prints and that's all I have. But he was very, very vociferous in speaking out against the use of atomic bombs and atomic energy for warfare. And then, but then you went to Paris. Well, I went to Paris um, because of male infidelity. 
uh, my best friend's husband, she learned, was having an affair. And she was not very pleased by this. And so she confronted him and said, uh, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, you go home to your mom while I decide and make up my mind. And she said, no way, I'm not doing that. So if you want to get rid of me for a while, while you'd make up your mind, um, I'm going to Paris and I'm taking Marilyn with me and you're going to pay for it, which is exactly what he did. And that's how I got to Paris. I never would have gone otherwise. And these photographs are on the left, me in my little uh, hotel room on Rue Monsieur Le Prince. I don't think the hotel is there anymore. And on the right, it's a photograph of me with somebody you may know, Bing Crosby. And that was taken a few years later when I started to sing in a very smart dinner club in Paris. And he was one of the guests and he invited me to his table and then invited me to the races at Longchamp. And he had a system of that he was completely sure was a winner. He would walk around the um, horses before a race and he would look at the jockeys and then he would look at the horses legs. And on this basis, he would place his bets and um, never won one of those uh, races. I think you probably all know this lady, Edith Piaf. And Edith Piaf, dressed in white, is one of my favorite photographs because her theatrical persona, as you know, was of the sad, depressed lady with very dramatic love problems and always dressed in black. And this photograph was taken at the Grand Hotel in Paris, where she and her entourage had gone to have tea. Now, at this time, I was interested in singing. And I had already got a job singing in Chez Carrère, which was a very fine um, dining club, not, not a cabaret. And it was the only club in Paris at the time that the then Princess Elizabeth was allowed to have dinner at. And I got that job quite by chance. I was having dinner myself one evening with some friends and we were singing happy birthday. And at the end of our singing, a gentleman approached me and said, I'm a, uh, uh, an agent and um, I'm looking for a singer for a small ensemble. Would you like to audition? And so I said, yes. And I went and I auditioned and I got the job. And it was singing at Chez Carrère off the Champs-Élysées. And Carrère's was a really special club and the ensemble I worked with was that of a man called Leo Choliac, who was a very, very fine musician himself. And he created songs that you probably have heard by Charles Fanet singing La Mer and quite a few other songs. And at one point while I was singing at Carrer, a an American uh, singer came and joined our ensemble and his name was Eddie Constantine and Eddie uh, was translating songs from French into uh, English into French and as Piaf was working up the Champs-Élysées at the Casino de Paris he dropped in on her to try and interest her in uh, using some of his songs and she kind of flipped over him and they started an affair and she would come into 
our club every night after she got finished with her entourage and she would collect Eddie and take him home for breakfast. Um, she had just bought a house in the Bois de Boulogne and she was decorating it. So everything took place in the basement of this house. And I might add that had there been a whiff of my wanting to take photographs of any of this, I think I would never have been allowed to. But the fact that I was more or less in the profession made me more of a friend. And amongst all of her people around the breakfast table in the basement of this house that was being refurbished were the widow of Marcel Serdan, who was a boxer and from Morocco. And he had just been recently killed and in an airplane crash and had been her great love. And so she had gone to Morocco and she had said to his wife, Marcel, Marcella, I loved your husband. You loved your husband. We should be mourning together. I want you to come to Paris and stay with me. So Marcella Serdan was having breakfast at the table at the same time. There was the young Charles Asnavour who was writing songs for her. And there were quite a lot of people sitting around that table. And after breakfast, every morning, we would go into a little shrine room that she had constructed just off the kitchen. And there were candles and we would sit there and we would light a candle for Marcel Serdan. And it was very moving. And this photograph of her laughing is, as I say, one that I adore because one thinks of her as very doer. She wasn't, she had a funny sense of humor and she loved love. In my spare time, I used to get on a bus in the morning and go on the bus to the end of the line. And I was starting to take photographs. And this is a photograph I took at a place at the very end of the line. And um, it was children playing in a old slum. I found the slum. It was just off the Bastille. There was a little alleyway and sort of like a white rabbit going down a hole and Alice following. I've, I went down this little alleyway and found myself in this huge, huge, what had been an Edwardian, uh, very elegant um, cité and beautiful buildings, but time had taken its toll and these um, buildings had become slums and all of these little children were out in the street playing and I guess the adults, the parents were working and I just took photographs of the kids in the streets and they became my first series of photographs. Many years later, in fact, uh, the Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris had an exhibition of all of these photographs, which was coordinated by a professor of um, photography at Brighton University, Dr. Julia Winkler. Uh, she put together a marvelous exhibition and they were all to have been, of course, seen by people ultimately because of COVID. Um, the photographs had to be shown virtually, um, which is rather sad because they're rather lovely, touching photographs of young children who, despite the poverty of their environment, were happy and 
joyous as kids can be. At the other end of one of the lines, at a place which is a suburb of Paris, which is Boulogne Biancourt, I took these photographs. Now, Boulogne Biancourt had two ends of the lines. One end of the line was in the leafy part, which was very um, middle class and artistic because there were film studios, there were film directors, there were actors, and anybody involved in film production. But if you went to the further end of the line, which apparently I did, um, I got off to see real despair and desolation. It was a working class neighborhood, and it was the home of the Renault car factory. So there were quite a lot of people around, but also a lot of people sleeping on the streets, which was very sad to see. I don't know if you recognize this gentleman, but he is rather famous. His name is Henri Cartier-Bresson. And Cartier-Bresson became my mentor in about 1960 in Paris. I had met previously, as chance would have it, my whole life, a lot of serendipity. I had met an Indian writer whose name is Mulkraj Anand. And Mulkraj Anand was one of few Indian writers writing in English at the time. And he had met Cartier-Bresson in Paris, uh, in India, when Cartier was out there. And they had become friends. And in about 1960, Mulkraj Anand came to Paris and introduced me to Cartier-Bresson. And asked him to take me under his wing, as it were. And so he did. And I found myself often going on shoots with him. And I was invited as part of the family to his home when he was married at the time to an Indonesian dancer called Ratna. And they would look after me in a kind of familial way. And Henri was very generous in looking at my early photographs and helping me along the way, as it were. Although I must say, he was not the kind of mentor who would say, now do this and do that. He always would look at a photograph and say, if you did this or you did that, implying cropping, the photograph would have this kind of feel. But if you cropped it in a different way, or if you had shot it from a different viewpoint, it would have that kind of a feel. So he was never didactic <clears throat> in the way he approached giving me information and help. And you would go around in the streets together and because you were small and a woman with the camera, right. you were like a decoy. Well, that's true. People would notice you and then he would be taking the photos. That's right. That's a photograph of a model and, I, you. and me somewhere in the background. Um, I always hate to be photographed, actually. She was a marvelous American girl who I did some beautiful pictures with. Uh, this one is a very famous and favorite one. Lots of people love it. We had been shooting all day ready to wear, which was new in Paris. And at the end of the shoot, 
she did this silly pose, um, which is adorable. I call it funny bunny. This is a, a part of that ready to wear shoot. Um, Post-war France uh, was opening up to new young designers who were uh, doing ready to wear. And prior to World War II, ready to wear in France had not been that widely spread about. Uh, middle class women would buy their clothes uh, have their clothes made for them by their little Paris dressmakers, um, whereas the very rich, wealthy women would go to the Maison de Haute Couture, and they would pay thousands, as they still do, for having their clothes made to measure. And when I was invited to take some photographs of the new ready-to-wear I took the, the model out to the street. Why are you doing that? So that they can see lots of examples. It's the same one. Yes. Anyway, this is a different one. And this one is another ready to wear and a little voyeur in the background, getting wet watching. And this little child. It, she was one of the little ones who who came along and we plumped her up on the um, railing and she just couldn't care less about anything. She was just hanging on for dear life. This is another one in Montmartre of uh, the ready to wear, the early ready to wear. Look at this amazing background, this sort of really decrepit house. You just don't see that anymore in Paris. I'm sure you would. All fixed up. Well, the thing is that at that time, um, the taking of fashion, the taking of fashion photographs was mainly um, using the haute couture models. Now, this was Christian Dior boutique. And although it was not cheap, it was cheaper than going to Christian Dior, uh, having something made up. And this was, again, ready to wear, but it was very high design ready to wear. This now was not ready to wear. This photograph was taken, I don't know if, He's still there, but at a restaurant called the Tour d'Argent in Paris, overlooking Notre Dame. And that was an haute couture dress by Givenchy. I love this photograph. And you've got the Seine in the background and Notre Dame. Yes. It's a beautiful location. Yes. Then in 19... In around 1958, mm. the French were beginning to have problems with their colony, Algeria. And there was a very big movement for national independence. And I was living in Paris at the time. I had by then married and my husband was a himself a um, foreign correspondent for a British newspaper. And I learned that the French had bombed a hospital on the border of Tunisia and Algeria. And this was a Red Cross hospital, and the refugees from Algeria had fled over the border into Tunisia to escape the strafing of their villages. 
and there were many refugees. And I have always, since recognizing it in World War II, at the end, the many, many people who were displaced people, they were called at the time, but people that war had made move. And there were many of them in Algeria and I wanted to do a story about them. And so I went to Tunisia where I was able to make contact with the Liberation Army and said I wanted to photograph the refugees and not too far, please, because I am pregnant and I don't want to go over bumpy roads. And of course I went over bumpy roads and ultimately came back with a baby who was not very happy about waiting to get out. So I had to stay in bed for about six weeks until she was ripe and ready. And in the meantime, after uh, I had been there to Algeria, uh, Tunisia, I sent photographs to Cartier-Bresson and I took them to him and he made a selection and sent them to the observer and the observer gave me my first front page which i was very proud of and it's a bit shriveled and torn but it's still there and the photograph of the mother and the children or the child is one of my favorite photographs and I just find her very beautiful. This is part of the Algerian refugee series. My husband's work took us to Rome. And in a, the early 60s. And there I was very fortunate to meet a number of important Italian intellectuals. Among them was Carlo Levi. Carlo Levi was a writer, a doctor, an anti-fascist and a painter. And he had been captured by Mussolini's people uh, printing tracts during the war against the fascists. And he was sent at the time to a very desolate place, which was Sicily. And he wrote a very beautiful book called Christ Stopped at Eboli, which was a remarkable book about his life as an anti-fascist. And he later became a, um, a painter and a doctor but he he was very helpful to me because we decided we were going to do a book together on Italian intellectuals and artists. And he introduced me to this gentleman who is Italo Calvino, who is a writer, a poet, and who came to Carlo's studio and I photographed there along, along with other people. Carlo Levy brought to my house one day this 
little lady sitting in the middle of the frame, whose name is Francesca Serio. Now, Francesca Serio was an illiterate lady from Sicily, and she earned her living by picking grapes, olives, little fruits in season on the estate of a Sicilian principessa. She may or may not have been married to the father of her son, who also later earned his living doing the same thing. However, the Socialist Party of Italy decided that these pickers should be unionized, and Francesca's son was one of the unionizers. And one day he was found dead, and he had all of the marks of the mafia on him, on his face. With the support of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and many intellectuals, Francesca brought the mafia to trial. This was the first time anybody had thought of bringing the mafia to trial. And Carlo Levi brought her to my apartment in Rome where I photographed her and later went with uh, him to uh, Palermo to the trial of the mafia and where I saw them all sitting in a cage and where she brought them to justice. They actually uh, found them guilty. However, there was a retrial and they were acquitted. There was no action taken ever against her, which would have, of course, uh, been a sign of guilt on the part of the mafia. But the man who actually did kill her son was later found dead so that he could not speak. She was left free and she lived quite a long life. And she is one of my heroines, if you want to say. She's got a little badge that she's wearing with a portrait of her son on it. Yes. And then you went to Lebanon during a time when it, there was peace. Yes. The cover of my book is taken from this photograph. It's a photograph of a cafe in Tripoli. Tripoli is in northern Lebanon and was mainly Muslim area. I was fortunate enough to have a friend who was a doctor and a Muslim who was of that area. And so when I wanted to take photographs and went walking in the marketplace and into cafes, uh, I was left alone because he was well known and accepted and I was able to take this photograph. I'm not sure if you can find me sitting there, uh, shooting there. I'm just behind the man in the fez in the center. Because there's a mirror behind him and Marilyn's in the mirror. Yes. Holding her camera. Yes. This is a photograph also of a street market and um, it 
it's just a jolly photograph of a stall holder with his bananas and in the same stall the men making their tin pots and selling fruits and vegetables it's, it's just a lovely market scene and lebanon at the time it was in peace but it was a very interesting place because it was a very meeting of east and west and modern and traditional yes These are some lovely photographs that Nina Emmett found as she was browsing. And they are of stalls, um, sellers in the marketplace. This is Tripoli, again in the north. And I, I'm very familiar with this photo, but I think uh, because I was there as a child, um, this kind of market scene was very familiar to me so that as an adult, when I went traveling in India, I felt really at home. There was something very familiar about it. This was also part of Lebanese life. It was a Miss Lebanon beauty contest. And I suppose it speaks for itself. What is that thing? It's people are sending in messages. Oh. Yeah. I was invited to a wedding in the Baker Valley, um, which was very interesting. It was a Muslim wedding, and yet nobody was veiled, and Everybody was very joyous. And one of the traditions in that area was that on the day that the bride was to leave her mother's house and go to be with her husband, he was to come with her uh, to her mother's house, collect her trousseau of pots and pans and bedware and whatever. And she was to sit on a throne in her mother's house and the women of the village were to come and dance and sing for her all day. She was meant to weep because she was sad to leave her mother and her mother's home. This is a, these are two photographs of the uh, festivities at, at the time at the wedding. Um, men and women were separated. So the men were having their fun and games, laughing and singing and dancing and drinking coffee while the groom was being prepared. He was being shaved and hair cutted and everything else. And on the right is a Bedouin dancer. These are more people dancing. You must have gone up high to get a view of so many people. You went out of your way to go somewhere. To oh, but photographers view. always go know, out of their way. Yeah. A massive view of everybody. This is a photograph taken at Sidon. Sidon is in the south of the country, and there is an old crusader chateau there, a castle that people often go to see. And also, um, it, there are ruins of old Sidon in the water along the edge. So you can see as you are walking along the edge, all of these old pillars. And this photograph, I saw as I was going down toward the castle of, uh, of, of the Crusaders and just snapped it. Interestingly, in my book, Dr. Coney has written something to the effect of my appreciation of masculinity. 
which he took to be the reason for me taking this photograph. Interestingly enough, to me, this photograph is a metaphor of all of the politicians at the time in the Middle East, but anywhere, flexing their muscles. So it is, of course, a question of the eye and the beholder. This, Sorry. this is the Crusader Castle at Sidon, and to your right would be the bank of where the man was flexing his muscles, and the lower photograph shows an even wider perspective. This photograph was taken at the horse races. Um, and I think there are a, a few of the horse races. No, this was in a little village. And these are little children from the village. There are, there are so many photographs in the book. And this is just a little selection of, of many. This is one of my favorite photographs. Um, I rather like photographing photographers. Um, taking pictures is an amazing way of living. And when I saw these interesting gentlemen in Tripoli, I couldn't resist taking their photograph. They were not happy about it at all. Then you went to London during a very swinging 60s time. Yes, I did. And I was befriended and mentored by a most wonderful photographer called Michael Pito. Michael was a Hungarian photographer who worked for the Observer, and he very generously printed up a lot of my photographs himself in his darkroom and also turned over quite a bit of work he was doing for the Observer um, to me. He was always helping young photographers, and I'm sure that those of the, some of them are, are still living and, and remember him well. Um, he turned over an assignment he had been doing for the Observer on a series of productions at the BBC, which were called Acting in the 60s. And I was fortunate to capture this young, handsome Albert Finney in between takes at the, uh, at the BBC on set. Um, we exchanged very brief words. I think he said, sunny morning, isn't it? And I said, yes, gulping in fear that I might say something wrong. I love this photograph. This is another photograph of somebody you may remember. Uh, what's his the name? Sky at Night? Yes. Moore? Patrick Moore. Yes. This beautiful lady is Sharon Tate, who I regret to say I photographed about a year before she was so sadly, brutally murdered. I photographed her in London as part of an assignment. This is Lee Marvin who I met at the home of a friend when he had come to England to film Dirty Dozen. And he, he was a very interesting man. And 
he asked me to take him around and show him a bit of London, which I did. And one afternoon uh, at my house, um, he and I were talking and I mentioned that I had never seen him do his wandering star song. And he took off his boots and he got up and he sang it for me. This is lovely Joanna Lumley, who has actually written a little piece in my book, as has Twiggy. Um, I did some fashion photography for Jean Muir, the most wonderful English designer. And uh, this was one of the photographs taken of the early Joanna Lumley. Uh, when she was modeling for Jean Muir. This was taken just before a Jean Muir fashion show. And uh, she's on the bottom left. She's on the bottom left. A little picture of Twiggy taken at a photo call um, where you can see everybody is all pressed up to photograph Twiggy. I'm rather fond of this. I think it shows her so sweetly. And there's a little um, um, thing from Twiggy in the book as well. Yes, she, she wrote a little thing as well. This is a photograph of a model wearing a favorite garment of Biba. Biba was a lady called Barbara Hulanaki, who was a, a marvelous designer of women's wear, and she opened up several boutiques in um, Kensington until she finally got herself a complete department store. And this was a favorite dress, which was a little I think it was a brown, little brown, lace, brown dress. lace dress. Yes. And while you were in London, you went to India. Yes. Um, when I, I had been doing all of the fashion work to survive, but at one point, my friend, the Indian writer Mulk Rajanand, suggested that I come to India and do a picture story, which he called would be the day in the life of Indira Gandhi. He presented the idea to her and she agreed. She always called him Uncle Mulk or Chacha. And I went in 1972 to India and went to Bombay and drove from Bombay to Delhi in order to meet her. On the way, Pakistan was declared war upon by Mrs. Gandhi. And it took me 10 days to drive. And during those 10 days, one of the world's shortest wars took place, which India won, but at great cost to everybody. And that is a photograph of the Taj Mahal being covered up with nets and branches so that it wouldn't gleam in the night, in the night under the moon so that the planes flying from Pakistan would not have a clear direction to Delhi. One of the rare photographs of me somewhere in there, um, boarding the plane to go to. The military plane that uh, was transporting Prime Minister Indira Gandhi on her tours around Kashmir. Yes, following the war. 
And this is a photograph of Mrs. Gandhi boarding the plane, uh, which was going to take her on that tour after the war, uh, where she visited soldiers in hospitals. And she also spoke to rallies and to saw visited, uh, visited uh, soldiers and, and the army officers. She liked roses, and I liked this photograph of her presenting a rose to a wounded soldier during that tour. These are Javans, Indian soldiers. So in this section of the book, which is chronological, suddenly we start to see color photographs. These were photographs taken on the way. All the people waiting to see her. They were welcoming her everywhere she went. Were you in another car at the front? I was in another, I was in a Jeep. Yes. I was always in admiration at the women journalists hopping in and out of those Jeeps in their saris. I at least had the benefit of trousers. This is Mrs. Gandhi at a rally in Kashmir where she spoke to masses of people. At her home in Delhi, this is a photograph of her grandson, Rajiv, Rajiv Gandhi's son, Rahul, who is now head of the Congress party in India. And these are all the sandbags that have been put up to protect her house. Bangladesh was a dreadful thing. My friend Mulk Rajanand wanted to go to Bangladesh to see who of the writers were still alive. And so we did go. And one of the first people he met was Sheikh Mujib Rajan. Rahman, who was called the father of Bangladesh because he had been the early uh, supporter of Bengali as national language instead of Urdu, and one of the reasons why this country was invaded by Pakistan and ultimately went to war. His house was totally destroyed and was this ransacked. Was ransacked. And these are just some pictures of what the country looked like after the war. That is Dr. Mulk Rajanand uh, on the right. And on the left is a gentleman from Bangladesh. I saw this expression of pain in everybody's eyes and I wanted desperately to make a photograph of those eyes, but I only saved this one, I guess. Many young women were raped during this period, before the war and during the war. Hundreds of thousands. And this is one of the girls who survived. And unfortunately, many of the girls were not taken back home because the families felt that by being raped, they had dishonored the family. Therefore, they were outcasts 
and many camps were set up later to house them and support them. Eventually, some were allowed to go back home, others weren't. Children following the war made some pictures of what it was like, and I was fortunate to meet in London a writer from Bangladesh who had escaped, and his name was Syed Shamshul Haq. And after the war, Haq collected these photographs, or these drawings by children um, of their perception of the war. All of these are in my book. Is the last photograph in the book? This is a farewell photograph, taking pictures is an amazing way of living. And I'm just one photographer among many. This is an Indian photographer who says farewell at the end of my book. And I hope you will visit him and me through the photographs I haven't been able to show you this evening. And will order a copy of this book, which I must warn you is quite heavy. Don't drop it on your toes. <laughs> and it is a, I'm, I'm going to be selling some copies through the um, Shoreham Society and they are going to be able to have a little bit of money from the sales. So that is, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs>